most of you are familiar with the Jack for those uh, with the first time that are here, Junction is the space that you see here and we focus on Southeast Asia. We try to promote discussion on Southeast Asia as well as interaction among uh, different people from different stakeholders on key issues for this region. Recently we have done quite a lot of work on uh, Myanmar because of the particularly the condition after the coup last year, but we don't we continue to give attention to other uh, crucial issues for this region and migration is for sure remain a very important uh, one. So we are very honored to have here Andy Hall. I think for people in Thailand it's quite famous or infamous. <laughs> Some people may see from two sides. He has had a number of, actually he was my colleague at the Institute for Population and Social Research at Maidon University when he did the research on seafood industry and the exploitation of migrants uh, in the seafood industry and that lead to a number of cases for defamation and after this makes a long story, I don't know how many years it took. Maybe eight years. Eight years, yeah. So he had to leave the country and eight years of court case, which he bravely <laughs> survived. And uh, after that, all the charges were uh, dropped. So basically, there is, he's a free man. He lives now in Nepal but he continue to advocate for migrants' rights in different ways, using different kinds of strategies, and some of them are controversial, others are uh, uh, more accepted, and I think he can tell us more about his current work. So this will be a conversation, and by the way, my name is Pia Shortino, and I am the founder and director of C. Junction. So this will be just a conversation among us and also the people that are following online. So first, Andy, why you don't tell us a little bit about yourself and your recent work? Okay, uh, good uh, evening, everybody. Uh, and it's, uh, thank you very much, Rosalia, and the uh, Southeast Asia Junction for inviting me to, to have this conversation with everyone here and uh, also with joining online. So I guess I'm, uh, even my title is a bit confused, so I, I guess I refer to myself as a migrant worker rights specialist. Uh, I think that's kind of developed over time, that's what I refer to myself as, because I work on migrant worker issues, migrant worker management issues, migrant worker rights issues. Uh, but I also, as, as Rosalia said, I used to work at Manion a long time ago, so I'm kind of, uh, was an academic, and I guess still I'm an academic. Uh, if we look at the kind of work that I do as research, uh, so I can be a researcher also. Uh, I'm also uh, an advisor for some different companies, uh, different organizations. And what else am I? I'm an activist, I guess. I guess deep down, uh, I'm always an activist. That's, that's the thing that always uh, motivates me. And, and in whatever position I'm in, I'm always uh, trying to stay outside the box and, and being active. Then I guess also um, I... I, yeah, that, that's the kind of work I do. I'm also originally from a legal background, so a lot of some strategies that I follow are legal also. So I, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer in some ways, although I never got my degree. And then these days I'm focusing mostly on forced labor issues. And I guess also I, I would like to say that I'm focused on business and human rights. So uh, my work is focused on linking the abuses that migrant workers face with business and human rights. So I think I can talk a bit more about that maybe later, but it's not a human rights angle. I mean, for many years I worked on human rights issues. So I looked at migration and human rights, and I used to, every year or every few months, I used to fly from, I remember flying from Bangkok to Frankfurt and Geneva, and I used to spend so much time in Geneva at the UN Human Rights Council talking about human rights, non-discrimination, rule of law, um, all these basic human rights issues, and, and I did that for so long. And I mean, it was successful in a way, and I worked with networks, with regional networks, local networks, international networks, mostly at the UN it was international networks, to focus on this whole issue of uh, human rights of migrant workers. And, and I used to work with lawyers in Thailand, a very good group of lawyers who, if 
some of them became my own lawyers, and, and, and many of them I'm still in contact with now to bring litigation against the Thai government um, in the administrative court, uh, in, the, in the different court systems related to discrimination and migrant worker access to um, social security. Uh, it's one of the biggest cases that we did um, for disabled workers in Thailand who couldn't get access to compensation. So it was very much a human rights angle, and I, and I focused on human rights for many years. Uh, and then it was really about 2011, 2012 actually, I, I actually became quite friendly with the diplomats at the, U, at the Thai mission um, in Geneva, uh, and, and uh, I became friends with them um, in, in many ways, because I engaged with them a lot, even though I was very much adversarial against the Thai government's policies. And then some of the diplomats that I used to engage, they were kind of immersed in the culture of the UN, uh, Human Rights Council, and there was a new debate that was forming back then. It was, it was, it was already there, but it was called the Business Human Rights Debate, you know, the UN Guiding Principles on Business Human Rights, and it focused on linking human rights with business. You know, business controls the world. You know, it's not really governments in some way; it's business. You know, so so the diplomats said to me, you know, look, some of the diplomats who I, who I know very well and uh, who now actually some of them I'm working with, they said, if you link the abuses that migrant workers are facing with business, with supply chains, with the global markets, then we think your work will be more effective. If you just focus on the Thai government and the Thai systems and the Thai culture and the Thai challenges, then okay, you'll have some success, but we feel that you're not having your greatest potential. So we really recommend to you that you start to look at business human rights issues, uh, how global companies are involved in all these issues. Uh, and because I very much focus on Thailand, the Thai government, Thai companies, uh, and usually for media we used to focus on the links with international, but, but not very much. And so at the same time I was contacted by Finwatch to do kind of what became a very famous study called Cheap Has a High Price, looking at the tuna and um, pineapple industry. And it was kind of then that I kind of, I guess, uh, hit the bullseye, you know, in terms of really became true when we published the information about abuses of migrant workers in the pineapple and the tuna industry in Thailand, but we linked those specifically to the global market, to the Finnish market actually, it was a Finnish research by Finwatch. When we did that, it just unleashed a huge uh, potential for advocacy, which I, I'd never experienced before with human rights issues. You know? Like when we started to link companies, you know, whether it be Tesco's or Morrison's or Costco or Walmart, or even government procurement agencies, or when we started to link those people to the abuses, then not only did it become more effective, uh, more successful in advocacy, but actually the media also became more interested. They had a they had a hook, you know. Whenever you work with the media, they always say, oh, "This is really great, Andy, but what's the hook? You know, how can we hook people? How can we write the story? How can we link it to people in America or in Europe or or in the UK?" And so I found a hook. You so I guess I transitioned from from human rights work to business human rights work, and I, I think that that's really important now. When I I, I, I live in Nepal now, um, I also spend a lot of time in Malaysia, in Thailand, and in, in Bangladesh, in Cambodia, in Myanmar, and I still see a, quite a, a challenge in the business human rights discussions in those countries. You know, business human rights is something that's more developed in the West. Um, in, in Europe, in the US, in Canada, in Australia, people are talking a lot about business human rights. But in this area of the world, people are they are starting to talk about it more, but they're still focusing on human rights issues. So there's a potential for, for, for change and for advocacy that's not really coming out there. And so I guess from 2011, I started to focus on business human rights. And, and through the years, um, originally business human rights meant companies. You know? So I focused on companies. I, I focused on, on big companies like Walmart or Costco or Tesco or, or Morrison's or Carrefour or, or any of these companies. And then later on, as I started to do more work, uh, I started to focus more on um, brands. You know? So not companies, but brands, you know? and big brands like uh, garment brands or seafood brands or uh, gloves brands, medical brands. And then as my work became more and more involved, I started to focus on investors. And that's when I really felt that we were going up another year, you know, because investors really have power, you know, even over the companies, you know, the investors invest in the companies and the companies are the ones that are involved in these activities. So I started to engage more with investors. And then later on, um, I started to, when I started to advocate with companies, 
like companies respond in very many different ways. You know, some companies are some the majority of companies they don't even respond to the emails. You know, I'm doing work at the moment in the Middle East in the Gulf of UAE in Qatar. The companies never reply. They just see the emails. They they ignore them. Um, and you send emails to the companies, they reply. Uh, they don't reply. And then other companies, they will reply and basically say everything you say is wrong, and you know it's the end of the conversation. And then in, in 2018, 2019, I think even from the back when we did the FinWatch research in 2012, some of the companies came and said, okay, we accept that we have these problems, and this is the junior industry in Thailand. They said that we accept that we have some children in the factories. You know, actually we didn't realize they were children. Their passports are false. So you know, we need to work to ensure that these people are not working in our factories, or we need to remediate them. We need to fix the problem. Uh, and these indicators of forced labor, yes, we have them in our factories. Yes, we have problems. We want to work with you. We want to work with Finwatch. Um, and, and I did many projects with Thai Union Group in, when I was as part of the Migrant Worker Rights Network. I was International Affairs Advisor, and I worked with uh, Thai Union Group. Uh, and then, you know, as, as I moved on, uh, as I say, when we got to 2018, 2019, and I came back to, um, to live in Nepal, and I started doing more campaigning on Malaysia issues, I started to find companies actually approaching me and saying, well, thank you so much for this information. We're not aware of this, so come and help us fix the problem. You know? If you have a problem, if, you, if you've highlighted a problem, we accept that problem, and we want to work with you to fix the problem. So how can we work with you? Can we work with you to another organization? Can we work with you as a consultant? Can we work with you voluntarily? What are you comfortable with? Uh, so I think in 2009, 2020, uh, I started to get, I was engaging with the CP group in Thailand on ethical recruitment issues because workers were facing challenges in the recruitment from Myanmar and Cambodia coming into Thailand. And because I had some contacts through the years with people in CP, they approached me and said, well, help us, you know, come and help us because we recognize that you have knowledge. So, so come and help us, you know. Um, and it was very difficult back then. I, I, I was quite confused for <laughs> how to do that. You know, how, how can I how can I work with companies? Um, and then the same thing happened in 2019, 2020 in Malaysia. You know, one of the biggest uh, palm oil companies, uh, Saim Dhabi. When I wrote the complaints to them about recruitment issues, they replied to me and they said, "Well, come and help us. You know, we want you to help us. We want us to fix the problem with us." And so I, I started helping them. Um, and then I also became a member of their Human Rights Commission when they launched the Human Rights Commission when they were sanctioned by the US government. And then I had to resign a few months later because they weren't giving me uh, information. They weren't being transparent with the information. Um, and I resigned from the Human Rights Commission but carried on working with them in a different role. Um, so I've actually worked with companies and resigned. You know, I've been critical friends to companies and, and I try to work with companies when it's possible. Uh, and I also work a lot with investors. And then increasingly I've been focusing on Malaysia. So I think uh, Rosalie asked me to say just a little bit about Malaysia. I mean, the situation in Malaysia is very similar to Thailand. I don't think there's that many differences. But if we look at recruitment fees that migrant workers are paying to come into Thailand, we're sometimes talking about a few hundred dollars. Maybe they cross the border. Maybe in COVID or in, in other times where this is more difficult, maybe they're paying a thousand dollars or something like that. Maybe they're paying less. But most migrant workers. I mean, they pay maybe hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get into Thailand, but in Malaysia, it's thousands of dollars. So if you're coming from Bangladesh to Malaysia in 2000, 2016 to 2018, the workers paid five thousand dollars each. You know, I mean, that doesn't happen in Thailand. Maybe for some trafficking or some abuses in Thailand, yes, workers do pay a lot of money. But generally, migrant workers, low-skilled migrant laborers coming into Thailand, they don't pay five thousand dollars. So that. The scale of the problem is is, um, is really different in Malaysia, mostly because of the recruitment fees. Uh, and of course, in, in Malaysia, they still have a cane lashing. You know, they have a more uh, ferocious, more more inhumane uh, migration policy. But the same issues that occur in Thailand with the securitization of migrant policies, the focus on the Ministry of Home Affairs, the Ministry of Interior in Thailand is the same. Uh, and uh, many of the industries that but particularly recently I've been focusing on the glove industry because of the COVID crisis and, and, and those issues. So yeah, I think that my, my, my work has really changed. Um, and also, one of the things that I've started to engage a lot more in is engaging with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Department, which is uh, the Homeland Securities in the U.S. They have a, a forced labor unit. And this forced labor unit was the first, and it's, it's almost the only country in the world at the moment that can actually stop goods coming into the US if they're related to forced labor. 
And so there was some changes in US law in 2016, which meant that this provision was used a lot more widely, not just with China for political reasons, but more widely um, in 2016 onwards. So I started to work with the US uh, Customs and Border Protection Department, um, which has led to seven uh, sanctions, or we, we call them trade enforcement actions, being imposed on glove companies and palm oil companies in Malaysia, which has had a huge impact, um, uh, far greater than any activist um, could have. I um, mean, actually blocking the goods coming into the U.S. from Malaysia. And so I've been working increasingly with them. Now these powers are coming in in Canada also for the Customs and Border Services Agency. And then I'm also working alongside this whole debate that's happening in Europe now also about developing forced labor, sanctions, uh, and mandatory human rights due diligence for companies. And so I've used a lot of mechanisms, um, these trade mechanisms, to, to really... Uh, to try to have impact and, and leverage in, in the work that I'm doing, uh, all stemming from the workers' information. You know, all of the work that I do stems from workers' voices, workers' uh, experiences. Uh, it, it comes from that, but it's just how you use it. And then also, increasingly, I've been using litigation, um, but more international litigation. You know, even in Thailand or in Malaysia, um, in many of the countries in this region, the court systems um, are quite challenged. You know, in, in ensuring justice for, for vulnerable people whether it be access to justice or whether it be their experience of the justice system is quite poor. Um, and of course, that's not to say that West Wales doesn't have many problems in its justice system, but it, it's kind of a different, uh, uh, different problems. And so I've been increasingly focusing on litigation issues. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I worked with a team of lawyers in London to launch a judicial review of the British government's purchasing practices in relation to forced labor in the gloves industry. Um, and I'm now working on some other litigations which will become uh, more known um, in the coming days and weeks uh, related to, to companies uh, also. So I think my approach really has broadened uh, from, from someone who was focused on, on uh, human rights and uh, advocacy. You know, I think this would put beyond advocacy, this, this one. I mean, I, I'm still an advocate, I'm still an activist, uh, but I'm using many, many different strategies to, to achieve the aims. And uh, I think the, the, the results are positive. Uh, one of the things that I'm facing now is uh, as, the, as the campaign or the strategies become more successful, the stakes become higher, you know, because uh, in, Th in Malaysia, I, I, I've done some activities that have really impacted companies hugely. You know, when companies get sanctioned by the US government, it can have huge impacts. It can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing. So the work that I've done in Malaysia has resulted in about $150 million being paid back to migrant workers in glass factories in remediation for the recruitment fees. They paid $150 million, the workers got back. And none of those workers suffered really any negative impact because we're in the middle of a COVID crisis. The companies are so rich, and therefore the campaigning resulted in workers getting more. You know? But if you choose the wrong target for your campaign, then the workers can lose everything. They can lose their jobs, they can lose their, lose their security. Even uh, whistleblowers can, can really find themselves in, in a lot of difficulties. So the stakes have become much higher and, and as, as Rosalia said, uh, uh, people, a lot of people appreciate my work, a lot of people are critical of my work because it's very much focused on, uh, on it's not an institution or organization that I'm working, you know, a big organization. I have so many people that I work with. I have a team of workers, former workers. We're a big team, um, but we don't work as an organization. We don't work as a as a, like you will see many organizations working in this area, NGOs, trade unions, uh, we, we don't work in that formal model. We work in a very informal model with myself as kind of a figurehead. But actually there's a lot that goes on behind it, but I'm just the one that is often seen. You know? um, and that's kind of a different model to a lot of other organizations. But definitely I work very closely with uh, civil society organizations and also with trade unions. So I think that's kind of an introduction. So we'll go from there. So. I think this is a very interesting uh, introduction. I'm sure there are a lot of points that maybe are not fully uh, clear. So maybe I can start to just some details, uh, questions. Uh, when you talk about litigation, exactly what you mean? Uh, I think you, maybe you can explain uh, the procedure and what it implies. And then maybe we go in more details also about the other strategies. So litigation, as I said, like my first litigation, um, this is, I can speak fluent Thai, yeah? And I can read and write fluent Thai, and that's because I spent years, 
careful in case any of the lawyers are watching, but I spent years correcting legal documents, you know, that lawyers used to write. Actually, I just corrected one today, but that's a different issue. I won't talk about that at the moment. But lawyers write documents, and I used to read them and correct them. So, you know, when I was in Thailand, we took litigation against the Social Security Office. It was a very famous case, uh, the Nang Nung case, uh, a disabled worker in Thailand who, had a, who became disabled in the Shangri-La Hotel in Chiang Mai. And she tried to get access to work compensation benefits from the Thai government social security system. And the Thai government said that she was an illegal worker who had been granted permission to temporarily stay in Thailand. Therefore, she couldn't access the, the government's compensation system. And so we took action against the government, a judicial, it's kind of a judicial review in the administrative court, to try to get the government to revoke a regulation or a circular that didn't allow irregular migrant workers access to social security compensation. So that was the first example when I, when I took the action. Um, and then we also took cases on behalf of Nangnum against her employer to try to get compensation for her in the court system. So this is very much domestic, you know, and in the end I think that the money that she got, I think it was, I don't remember the exact amount, I think it was about 600,000 baht, if, if I'm right, but it was, it was one of the highest settlements that we ever got, actually, because it appeared on the back page of the Bangkok Post. One of my good friends, Erica Fry, she used to write on Spectrum. I don't know whether they still have Spectrum. It's the, the back page of the Bangkok Post. And, and we, we linked the abuses that she suffered to the Shangri-La Hotel construction site in Chiang Mai. And then all of a sudden, this money appeared. Um, I'm not sure where it came from, but we can assume it came from somewhere. So that was the kind of litigation that I did um, uh, at that time. And then recently, uh, because after that, I mean, we did this all this social security litigation. Uh, we also recently have started to focus on on litigation that involves migrant workers taking actions against companies, you know. So actually the migrant workers focusing on migrant workers in Thailand or Malaysia or in other countries actually taking action in foreign courts against the uh, companies, you know. So it means that they actually, if they can't have a claim against uh, a, a local company, then we can try to focus on the person who's buying the products from the local company, you know. Maybe we think the judicial system in the, the region where we're working is not going to work, so we try to take litigation um, with uh, international companies. So we file companies in uh, cases in foreign courts. And then recently, as I say, we took a case against the UK National Health Service, the Department of Health and Social Security, to say that their public procurement policies are, are not preventing uh, forced labour. So we're actually taking cases in the, in the UK courts uh, against, against that. And, and it's, it's a challenge because uh, the systems, the requirements of lawyers in the West or in, you know, and also I've been doing research also for, for many cases, for instance in Australia, also in Germany, um, also in Canada, I often get approached by lawyers who, we, we, I guess we can call them like, um, they're contingency fee lawyers. So actually they're, they're not doing it for free, but they want to get claimants um, or they want to explore cases whereby they will represent the workers and then they will get a, a percentage of the, of the reward that the workers get. So I often get approached by lawyers saying, look, you know, if, if any of your workers feel aggrieved that, that, that the companies that, that, that are buying the products that they're being, you know, that the companies they're being abused in, then they can bring a claim in the foreign courts. And, and it, but it's very difficult to satisfy these lawyers um, uh, that we have enough information to get a claim because the kind of information that we have and the kind of information they want is, is kind of uh, very difficult, uh, different, you know. They, they want much more information than we can provide you know, based on the reality on the ground. But, you know, with the advent of uh, social media and also, you know, mobile phones and videos and stuff like that, we, information is really available uh, much easier than what it was before. So, so I think that's the kind of litigation that I've been involved in recently. Thank you very much. More about the use of the U.S. Uh, border control and the Canadian. It seems these are the two that you are particularly using. Should I put my mask on, by the way? Am I being a naughty? <laughs> I didn't know you, but anyway, you have done it already. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I felt privileged as a speaker to take my mask off. Maybe that's not. I should. I should put my mask on. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, away from everyone. So, um, so this is a uh, really important, actually, and and 
I believe, actually, that the, the work that I've done with the US Customs and Border Protection Department uh, has really been, uh, it's been instrumental in, in laying out the systems that the US government uses to block goods coming into the US. You know, when I started engaging the US government in 2018 uh, on the glass issues in Malaysia, the system was quite a mess, actually. Um, they just started the system, it was very underfunded, uh, and they just, uh, they, 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 I'll just give a, a very brief explanation that before 2016, they had something called the reverse um, uh, the consumptive demand exception. So this consumptive demand exception, what it, mean, what it meant was that the US government wouldn't take action against goods coming into the US if they needed them. So if they needed the goods, even though they were made with forced labor, they could bring them in. You know? It's called the consumptive demand. They had a consumptive demand for those goods. Therefore, they were, there was an exception that allowed the US to import them into the country, even though they were linked to forced labor. Um, and that, that was the rule before 2016. And then during the Obama administration in 2016, they, they, they removed that um, consumptive demand exception. And they said, whether we need the goods or not, they cannot come into the US territory if they're made in a way that was contributed to in some form by forced labor. So they changed the, the rules completely. And that opened the door for them to start using these powers. Um, and at that time, I was uh, in Malaysia on a three-month um, exercise to map the electronic supply chain in Malaysia for forced labor. And so I did this mapping, and then every time I went places, the workers were like, well, you know, I had to find ways to, to speak with workers and, and, and the networks or the workers and the, the religious groups. I was using mostly religious groups, uh, remittance agents, uh, local uh, NGOs, uh, CBOs, uh, community organizations. They were like, you know, Andy, you're focusing on the wrong industry. <laughs> the electronics industry is actually Apple and HP and Intel and actually it's kind of advanced and the workers are kind of uh, in a better conditions, in, in, at least in the big export factories because of years of campaigning. So, but what about the gloves factories? I mean, have you ever looked at gloves factories? Have you ever been to, uh, to uh, Durex's um, condom factory? It's just horrific, the situation in these factories. And I'm like, oh, really? And, and at the same time, there was a, a UN General Assembly uh, resolution on modern slavery and public procurement supply chains. So we had the UK, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, five countries, the five eyes, saying basically they were gonna, they had a policy to prevent modern slavery in public procurement supply chains. And this was their policy at the UN General Assembly. And then I started going to the gloves factories, of which many of the gloves are going to the governments, you know, to hospitals. And it was just an appalling situation. Uh, I was just shocked at, uh, at how terrible the industry was. And I realized, oh gosh, you know, how could this exist when there's all these policies being uh, debated in the UN about public procurement? So I decided, that I would uh, start to do research on that issue. And I was quite lucky at the time, because obviously my time in Thailand, and also my time working uh, in the Myanmar with Aung San Suu Kyi and with, with other people, I had a, a lot of media contacts in the, in the region, um, even though I hadn't been engaging them for a few years because I hadn't lived in Thailand. And I rang up, I think I rang up a journalist from The Guardian, and one from The Telegraph, and one from Reuters, and one from ABC, and I said to them, do you realize what's happening in Malaysia with the gloves sector? And within, a, I think, two weeks of arriving in Malaysia, I had a Guardian team, an ABC team, and a Reuters team with me on the ground documenting the abuses. And at the same time, I came in contact with this US Customs and Border Protection Department. It was quite exciting at the beginning because it felt like I was working for the FBI or something. I used to get these calls, and they're just like, you know, it's this American investigator. It's a, you know, I'm just like, oh, you know, and interesting. And we, we used to have, like, uh, discussions. And, and, and then I started to realize that they were quite serious uh, institution or organization. So I started to, like, basically send them all the information. Um, and it was kind of like, yeah, they were just uh, engaging with all the information that I sent. And then about a year and a half later, I think it was, yeah, I, I mean, 2018, 2019, it was already, uh, because I kept having calls with them and kept sending them information and nothing was happening. And I started to feel, well, what are these people doing, you know? And then suddenly, they announced uh, sanctions on one of the glove companies, you know, in, in Malaysia. And uh, it was just huge, you know, huge uh, news, huge impact. 
Uh, and actually, the company almost immediately went bankrupt, actually, because it, it was a really terrible situation. And there was a very negative few weeks. Actually, workers were almost starving because they didn't have food and uh, no one was helping them. But it, it turned around very quickly. And then it, it became a success story um, as to this company, how it changed because of the US sanctions. And, and then a few months later, they launched sanctions against the biggest glove company in the world, Top Glove, the, the supplies. I think it's one in four or one in five gloves to the whole market. And then after that, they just sanctioned more and more and more and more sanctions. Um, and it's because of the work that I was doing with my team on the ground. I mean, we, their, their main you know, activists and sources. And as they took action against the companies and they blocked the goods coming into the US market, some of these companies, up to 50% of their goods were blocked. You know, So I mean, it was just a huge impact. Um, these companies were so rich from the pandemic that they basically just started paying back all the money to the workers, that the workers had paid to get the jobs that had left them in debt bondage. So as I say, until today, we reckon that there's about $150 million that's been paid back. Uh, and, and if I announce to the media or to anybody that I filed a complaint against the company to CPB, it has huge impact now. You know, I could say something to the media and say I filed a complaint against the company, a company could lose uh, 25 or 30 percent of its share value within 10 minutes or 20 minutes. You know, it's it, because people are scared that the company is going to lose its U.S. market. So it's a really powerful tool, and this tool is also being developed in Canada. Um, and even Canada recently we saw them uh, cancel some contracts because of forced labor. But the problem is that this tool is quite unique to the U.S. and Canada. So Canada is develop this tool because of the US, Mexico, Canada free trade agreement. So they have a, an obligation to develop this tool. But if we look at the UK, if we look at uh, Australia, if we look at Europe, if we look at maybe Japan or Korea or whatever, they don't have these rules. So even when we saw the, the Uyghur issues in China, many countries are struggling what to do about this situation. So it's a big political issue between the West and China, you know, Uyghur forced labor issues. But actually the UK, or Australia, or Europe, they don't have any power to actually stop those goods coming into their markets. You know? So one of the things that we face with the US and the, uh, the sanctions is that the company basically will, will be blocked from exporting to the US, which is not a good thing for them because it damages their reputation, but also they get good price from the US often. It's, it's kind of a high price they get for some quality goods. But what will happen is the companies will then just sell the products to other markets like China or Russia or, or, or other countries, even the UK, the, the Europe or Australia, so they can move around, you know, that's kind of a challenge with the system. But it's really been a, a very powerful tool that, 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 that we use and uh, it's, it's really pretty effective. And if we look at Thailand, um, it's as, as, as far, I mean, I know, for instance, the CPB rang me up a few times and said, by the way, do you know anything about this factory in Thailand? Actually, I didn't know about it. I, I tried to make some inquiries and I didn't get any information back. Um, but this is a tool that's never been used in Thailand. You know? It's never been used in Singapore, you know, uh, in, the, in this region. Uh, I think it's never been used also, I mean, maybe not focusing on migrant workers, but it's never been used in Myanmar. It's never been used in uh, Cambodia. Um, it's never been used in Philippines, um, Indonesia. So there is forced labor in these countries, in India. So it's, it's uh, but for migrant workers, we've used this uh, tool a lot in, uh, in Malaysia. So it's really a tool that can, um, that can really benefit uh, workers. But as I said, there is a flip side to it, that it can also have a very negative impact on workers. So you have to choose your target well. So for me, I chose the glove sector in the middle of a pandemic because I felt that well, the worst thing that can happen is that uh, the companies will sell their gloves to another country, you know, but the workers won't have any negative impact. So I really feel that the impacts on the glove sector have been hugely, almost almost 100% positive for workers. Um, but when we apply that tool to other sectors, uh, the result maybe won't be the same. So it's about working with, with these kind of organizations. And, and also, I mean, one of the things that people often say to me about the work that I do with CPB even companies, they'll approach me and say, can you send us your petition to the CPV? Can, can you send us the petition? And I say, what petition? And they said, well, the petition, you know? <laughs> like the, the huge document with all the annexes and all the files and all the evidence. And I'm like, well, I think there's about 2,000 emails that I send them, but I don't have a, you know, a, a, a dossier, you know? I don't have a, a particular file 
that I put together. So CPB, all the work that I've done with CPB as an individual, as, as someone working with other people, it's been very ad hoc. You know? We've shared information with them, we've worked together with them to, to ensure that the sanctions have been, uh, uh, have been imposed on the companies. But we haven't done it in a way that some of the international organizations do. So they, they put together a petition, you know, it can take years. So they will work, you know, we see this in some of the European NGOs, they put together petitions. So it can be hundreds of pages and, and they make the complaints to the CPB, but that's not the kind of work that I do as, as, as an individual. Okay, I think there will be some uh, questions, so I give first the uh, opportunity to ask questions about it, please. Yeah, I think it's okay with us. But now it's for the online, because we are uh, online. And yeah, and I had a question. Uh, how do you explain the eagerness of the US Customs to actually work on this? Like you said, you, you were even called by them, and them asking specific questions about like cases they're working on. How do you explain that kind of behavior for, for such an agency? Yeah, so there's often some confusion about US customs and, and what they do, yeah. And especially because it's part of the homeland security. It's, I don't know, maybe you're from America, I didn't hear the accent, maybe you're not. No. But uh, when you talk about the US uh, Customs and Border Protection Department, it's under the Homeland Security Department. And everyone assumes that these are the people who are um, snatching uh, migrant babies from their mothers at the border because it's the same department, right? And so people are like, how can you work with the Department of Homeland Security? I mean, these are terrible people. Actually, the US Customs and Border Protection Department, their policies on forced labor are protectionist policies. So they're meant to protect US businesses from unfair competition from overseas. So if workers are exploited and abused, the goods that will end up in the US are lower priced and therefore they will compete with the goods that US companies can produce. So the US Customs and Border Protection Department mechanisms are entirely protectionist, you know. And I, I talked about the first case that I did against WRP Gloves in Malaysia. And uh, the company w literally went into bankruptcy and there was a huge fight against the owners. And, and the workers were starving, you know. And I reached out to the US Customs and Border Protection Department, the US Embassy, because they, they're the ones that impose the sanctions, the US government. And nobody replied. And I'm just like, well, how can you not reply? Because the workers are starving because of your action. So surely you have to help them because you're there to help forced labor victims. You're there to help trafficking victims. And then I realized actually that's not their role. <laughs> their role is there to protect US businesses against unfair competition. So actually the, the motivation for their work is protectionism. It's not to protect migrant workers, it's to protect their economy. Um, but of course, you have to give credit to them because they have completely turned around the Malaysian gloves industry. So it's gone from an industry that didn't have any concept of what is forced labor, what is uh, social compliance. You know, Workers didn't have their passports, workers couldn't resign, workers were in debt, workers were forced to eat food, workers couldn't go outside, workers had freedom of movement restrictions. Workers were harassed, workers were abused, workers were in terrible safety conditions. And that has been completely revolutionized because of the US Customs and Border Protection Action. So the motivation is protectionist, but in some cases the, the result is very positive for workers. So that's kind of the motivation behind the US CPB um, approach. Which I think maybe it will be different to other countries, um, but that's the particular approach of the, of the, of the US um, Customs. We have some good questions from uh, online, so I will start uh, from uh, one question. I am curious about how much verification of facts you do when complaints are made. This is the first question. Uh, second question uh, from someone from the UN. I wonder if you feel that all the attention that you and Finn watch have encouraged for your court case has really benefited migrant workers themselves in Thailand, or has actually been something of a diversion from the core labor and human rights abuse faced by migrant workers in the country? I think these are some tough questions, but very important uh, to answer. The third one, how would you justify when the business and human rights paradigm seems to exclude the right to organizing or collective bargaining? 
many companies held up as ethical employers don't allow or encourage independent trade unions, which is arguably, arguably <laughs> the only social movement that has historically improved working conditions. I think we stop here, there are some more, but I think these three already are very important. Uh, so the first one about how many verification, how much verification you do. The second, whether your case with uh, Finwatch as it was a diversion or in support of worker rights. And the third, uh, how you, I mean, you seem to be enthusiastic with business and human rights paradigm, but this paradigm don't allow for union. Okay. Uh... Okay, let's, okay, we'll go in order that they were asked. So, the first thing that we need to verify is that the worker is who they say they are, right? So, when we engage any worker, we have to check that they're a worker at the factory or the, the workplace that they say they're a, a worker at, you know. So, we need to find evidence. Now, sometimes workers don't have documents in that sometimes their documents are confiscated, sometimes they never have been given any documents. But in the vast majority of uh, circumstances, we can link the person that we're speaking to to the company that we're investigating. You know? So workers have ID cards, they have visas, they have passports, they have pay slips, they have photographs of themselves working in front of you know, the company logo or something. So we have to verify that first. Uh, and then, you know, the, the methods that we use, I mean, the, the evidence that we collect, you know. So we'll talk about the concrete evidence first. As I said, uh, ID cards, wage slips, passports, visas, videos, photos. Um, and then we move into the issues of testimony, you know. We actually work at oral testimony. I mean, it, it's, it's spoken, right? It's not written down. It's not, you know, it's not evidence firm, but it's, it's testimony. Um, and then we will look at... Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of stuff we do these days comes from, like, for instance, uh, undercover filming in factories, you know. So either we will plant videos in factories or workers will send us uh, in, information. You know, a lot of workers have their mobile phones in, in, in factories. They're not supposed to, but they, they do. And so we, we, we really have to collect a lot of evidence um, in order to make a case. And it depends on, on, on the advocacy strategy also. If I'm going to write to a company and complain about something, I can just get a bit of evidence and write a complaint, right? Sometimes I do. I write a bit of a complaint to a company and say, look, this is the evidence. And they said, yes, 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 we've checked it. It's all true. How can we engage? You know? And that's enough for them. And actually, they provide me more evidence than I had in the first place. It happens. And then other companies, if we're really going to approach them, they'll say, well, you know, we don't have any problems. And then we have to collect more evidence, you know? And then, of course, if we're going to do litigation, or if we're going to do a campaign, you know, if we're working with The Guardian or the BBC or Reuters or whatever, I mean, their legal department has to verify every statement that they make, right? Some of the stories that I've done recently with the Reuters team in Malaysia, which is doing fantastic work, um, is when I read the story, I'm a bit like, oh, what happened to all the, all the evidence, all the really terrible stuff? And then I ran up the journalist and said, well, you know, and they're like, well, Andy, we can't publish it because we just don't have enough evidence, you know. But actually, the story itself is strong, but it's not as strong as I want it to be because we don't have enough evidence. So when you're doing public campaigns, when you're taking litigation, when you're becoming bolder, then you have to get more evidence, you know. I remember in Thailand that, you know, when I used to work in Thailand, also in Malaysia to some extent, for me, if I really want to campaign strongly on a topic, I have to sit down with the worker and look at their eyes, you know? Because I, I'm not sure when I'm doing remote monitoring online or using Facebook or, you know, uh, WhatsApp, it's not me doing it directly, it's the team that I work with. They're the ones engaging all the workers. But how can we be sure that what the worker's saying is really true? So for me, I really want to sit down and look the worker in the eyes and really understand their situation. But often that's not possible. Um, and a lot of the work that we've done since the beginning of the pandemic has all been remote monitoring, you know. And some people say, actually, remote monitoring, it's not as good as meeting workers face-to-face, -face, but actually it can be better because workers can speak to you whenever they want to, you know. You don't, you don't have to make an appointment with them. You don't have to do anything. When they're free, they ring you. So a lot of stuff is done through remote monitoring. But, you know, we really have to collect a lot of information. And a lot of allegations that we get every day, we cannot verify you. And if, if, if we're really going to take action, we have to have really, really strong evidence. So that's the, the first issue. 
Um, and also, I mean, the evidence these days, again, as, as the profile increases, a lot of the evidence that I get these days comes from whistleblowers, you know? So it comes from actually people within the companies, you know, themselves, or even auditors, you know? Auditors who do audits of companies and then find that nothing ever happens and they send me things. Whistleblowers, government officials, you know? Uh, recently, the work I'm doing in Malaysia, a lot of information about government issues is coming from government officials in the government. So it's not just workers, but also it's a triangulation method. You know, We can triangulate what the workers are saying with what the insiders are saying, what the whistleblowers are saying. So that's some of the evidence issue. In terms of my case, one of the things that, um, one of the, things that was, uh, the challenge about the case is that it was like uh, against me you know, as an individual. And, and that felt really uncomfortable. Because uh, I'm not somebody who wants to be a hero, you know. I'm not somebody who wants to be sacrificed my life. You know? It's not. It's not the way. It's not my character, you know. It's not about me. It's about the workers, you know. I'm just a tool. I'm just the person involved in this. And so the case was very much about me, you know. Uh, and somebody will say, "Well, is it a diversion?" You know, um, the case about you. No, no, it wasn't. It was so important because the white-skinned foreigner in the UK who was going through the Thai court system, who was being harassed for years and years and years, was a peg for the international media to focus on migrant worker rights in Thailand that couldn't happen otherwise. So every time somebody wrote a story about my case, it was about migrant workers, you know? It wasn't about me only. Of course, some, places, some stories were about me, but most of the stories were about migrant worker rights. And so I felt that my case really uh, advanced the, the migrant worker rights debate because it, it, it made something that people can associate with. Like definitely there's people around the world who can associate with the stories of forced labor victims, you know. They can read the stories, they can feel pain, they can feel anger, they can feel suffering, and they can relate to migrant workers. But for another kind of audience, they can't relate to the suffering of migrant workers in Thailand or Malaysia or in Singapore or whatever, but they can relate to the suffering of a foreigner who's being harassed in a court system. So it, it can appeal to different people, you know. Um, but I think it was uh, really successful. Um, I think the, the case was, um, and, and of course the case I won all, I mean, uh, again, uh, just to correct Rosili a little bit, because it's kind of important, the cases were dropped, but I won them, you know. Uh, the, the courts dismissed the cases against me. One case was dropped, the final case, but I, I won the cases. And I think that the, the precedents that we set down in the cases that I fought in Thailand as a Westerner with a lot of funding, with a lot of support, have been used by local activists as precedents, you know, to, to fight their own cases. And, and they've realized that, you know, you don't have to suffer in silence, you know. Um, a lot of activists suffer in silence. They face these cases, they don't have publicity, they cannot do anything. But a lot of activists have realized the kind of techniques that I use, they can use themselves. I think that was the second question. The question about unions, uh, my work, you know, is, for me, it's all about, the long-term issue is about empowering migrant workers um, to, to negotiate with employers themselves, you know, um, whether that be in the form of a, a labor union or whether it be in some other method of social dialogue. So, my work is always about supporting trade unions, you know. And all of the work that I'm doing in Malaysia now, um, and that I've done in the past, I always engage with trade unions, you know, whether it be industrial in the garment or the glove sector, or BWI in the wood or furniture sector, um, or the ITUC on the global governance issues, um, or, you know, all of these different unions, uh, I engage, you know. And also, I engage with a lot of the unions now, for instance, in Malaysia, in the electronics sector. I, I used to be an international affairs advisor for CERT, the State Enterprise Malaysian Confederation in Thailand. Uh, and so, I really work with unions, you know. But I think what I've realized recently, and, and again, I was having some good discussions. I was on a call the other day with uh, unions about uh, a case I'm working on now. It was the whole spectrum of unions from the ITUC down to the local unions is that my campaigning creates, a, our campaigning, myself and my team, it creates a space for organizing. You know, once investors get concerned, once brands get concerned, once people get concerned, it creates a space for organizing. I am not an organizer. You know, people who know me know that my character, my style of work, is not one to be able to bring so many people together um, in solidarity. 
you know, in a way that's needed for organizing. Organizing work is so hard, you know. If we look at Burmese migrants uh, in, in Thailand, you know, you have Karen, you have Kachin, you have uh, Burmese, you know, you have so many different ethnicities who have challenges within their own groups, you know. And in order to bring them together, you know, in Thailand you have um, different groups of people. Organizing into trade unions is really difficult and it's not my strength, you know. I'm not an organizer, it's very clear. But I respect trade unions, I respect the need to further freedom of association and collective bargaining, and I believe that my campaigning um, can be utilized by trade unions, um, and at the end of the day, the, 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 the need to have workers organized is, is the sustainable solution for the future, I believe that very much. And the, and the thing is that one of the things that I would say, and one of the things that sometimes I also get criticized for, is that some of my work with companies is about developing social dialogue within the workplace. You know? Social dialogue means the relationships between workers and employers and governments. You know? So that the workers can engage the employers, the workers can engage the government, the workers can have a voice. Trade unionism is, a, is, a, is social dialogue. And I work with companies to promote social dialogue within the workplace. So what that means is the companies allow workers to come together in welfare committees or safety committees to work with employers. You know? The company allows them to do so and the company creates a box for them to do so, and it controls them within that box. So for me, I think that's positive, and that's something that I did very successfully. I think with Thai Union, with the Migrant Worker Rights Network in, in Mahajai, in Songkai, in Thailand. But if you look at it from a trade union perspective, they would say, well, you've organized workers into what we would call a yellow union. You know, it's a union that's controlled by the employer. Um, but for me, I think any social dialogue in the workplace is good. And that's why I work with employers to promote social dialogue. But if ever there was a case where workers wanted to form trade unions, then I would also support them to support trade unions. You know. But as I say, I'm not an organizer. Um, and I think related to the business human rights framework, um, I mean, the UN business human rights framework has a role for unions, right? Unions are part of that dialogue. Um, I definitely agree that it's, uh, it's not a dialogue that focuses on trade unions and that focuses on organizing. But uh, I think, yes, that's one of the weaknesses of that dialogue, um, of that perspective, business human rights, you know. But definitely there's a space within that framework for unions and for organizing. It depends whether the opportunity is taken or not. So let's, uh, this is my own question, and then I will read some more. I think this relationship between uh, companies, workers, and you. So on one side, you fight with court case uh, for the worker, but then you also work for the companies. So uh, this is ethically could be questioned, right? Where uh, there is a conflict of interest, in a sense. A company can give you a consultancy so you don't bring a litigation case against the company, uh, even if well intentioned. Uh, so maybe you can uh, say something about uh, this. And then another question from uh, from the, again, there is a lot of question for you. <laughs> to what extent do you feel a focus on remediation can be an opportunity for a company to offset their duty to strengthen due diligence and address systemic labor abuses. So again, a critical question. Uh, and then we will go back later on to other questions. But this, this first, these two questions. So the, the, the aim of my work, you know, is to improve worker situations, you know, worker rights. Uh, and to improve the conditions of workers and to free workers from forced labor situations. You know, this is the aim of, 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 of my work. Uh, and of course, you can achieve that in many different ways. But in my experience over the years, uh, and again, I think I always say this, when the glove companies in Malaysia improved the conditions of the migrant workers, I didn't improve the conditions of migrant workers, it was the companies that improved the situation of migrant workers. I contributed to it, I, I campaigned for it, I pressured them, but I wasn't the one that did it. So, so when we want to make changes in the world of work, it's the companies that, that, that do it, okay? Maybe they should be forced to do it by the government or regulation 
or maybe they voluntarily do it. And in most of the circumstances that I've seen in Malaysia and in Thailand, it's the companies that do it because they feel they have to do it because of their buyers, because of their supply chains, not because of the government forcing them. In many cases, the government maybe is even complicit in the abuses that are going on. So, so, so the companies are the ones that change. And if a company wants to work with me to change the situation in the company, um, because they feel that they don't have enough skills or knowledge or understanding, or they want a critical perspective, then I, I feel that I've fought for many years to get into a situation to change the rights of migrant workers. But actually, I don't always want to be on the outside. You know, because sometimes you can do a campaign, and you can be very successful, but you're not the one that changes the situation. So you see the change and you feel happy, but you're not involved in the actual process itself. So for me, I get a lot of satisfaction, actually, from working inside companies to actually bring change, you know, because I'm actually the one who is helping the company to change the situation, meeting the workers, speaking to the workers, seeing how happy they are with the situation. So in a way, you've worked a lot to, to get into a position where you can make change yourself. You know? It's like a human rights campaigner who becomes a politician, you know, and I think we all know <laughs> good examples of that we need to look at Myanmar. And, and bad ones. Yeah, and bad ones also. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing, you know. And then the person will say, well, I'm not a human rights campaigner anymore, but I'm now a politician. So it changes, you know. What, how we can work changes. But maybe it's the same person, but they're, they're compromised in some way or they're challenged in some way. So, so for me, it, it, it's, it's, it's a natural progression, you know. But I'm always an activist. I'm always the same person that I am. And you know, for instance, when we work with companies, also the issue comes up of non-disclosure agreements. So you have to sign non-disclosure agreements. So when companies sign non when I sign non-disclosure agreements with companies, and when companies ask me to sign non-disclosure agreements, I feel that often it's lawyers that are asking for the non-disclosure agreement. I'm working with companies now in Malaysia recently, where we have it's a voluntary work, and there's no non-disclosure agreement. You know. And the companies recently, some companies have said to me, Andy, we need you to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I said, I'm not paid in consultant for you. Why would I sign a non-disclosure agreement? I'm an activist. And I won't sign it. You know? Whereas when you're in a paid role, people expect you to sign non-disclosure agreements. But in the work that I've done until now, I see the work that I've done as very positive. And I don't feel compromised with the work that I'm doing because I feel it's beneficial. It's beneficial to the workers. If there came a time, and again, also I'm not doing it for the money. You know, the money is not important to me. What is important is the work and the result. So I'm not doing it for the money, I'm doing it for the result. So I don't feel compromised at this stage, and maybe there will be a time in the future. And as I said, with the Slayer Darby Plantation Human Rights Commission, myself and Justine Nolan, one of the most famous uh, forced labor academics in, in Australia, we became Slayer Darby's Human Rights Commission in, I think it was uh, the beginning of uh, last year. And then we, they set up this Human Rights Commission, they did the PR, they announced we're working with Andy Hall, we're working with Justine Nolan, and it was big news. And then a few weeks later, we, where is the report? Where is the research? Where is the information? A few months later, we still don't have anything. And then we said to them, okay, either you're gonna give us the information or we're resigning, you know? Because we, we're not gonna do this, we're not gonna feel compromised. Because we're part of your Human Rights Commission, and we resign. You know, we said, no, we're not doing it. So as working as a consultant for a company, if at any stage I feel compromised, I will resign. Because I don't want to work for that company if I feel compromised. But until now, I don't feel like that. But the question that you mentioned, and again, this is uh, Rosalia mentioned, is that what if a company is employing you in order to prevent you campaigning against them, in order to prevent you taking litigation against them? My question is, is why is the company employing me? Are they employing me to prevent like um, criticism of their work, or they employ me because they want to benefit the, the workers, they want to improve, you know. If ever I feel that a company is employing me in order to um, prevent my campaigning, in order to prevent litigation, this is a huge issue now in Thailand. I mean, it's a huge issue that, that, that's being discussed now about my work, you know. But if you want to don't have any problems, you hire Andy Hall as a consultant, and then you won't have any problems. But it's not like that, you know. If a company hires me, it's because in my opinion, because they're committed to improving worker rights. If they're not committed, then I won't work for them. And there's many companies which I'm not clear, I'm not sure about, then I will always work with them as a critical friend or a voluntary person. And many companies now in, in Malaysia, I'm working with as a completely voluntary. 
you know. I'm doing a lot of work for them, but I'm not getting paid anything because I feel that getting paid from that company at this point in time is a conflict for me. So that, that's part of the situation. And the second question was about remediation. So, so yeah. So remediation is so important for workers. You know, uh, workers want remedy. You know, workers want something. You know, even workers want money. Yeah, they want money. They need money. So remediation is so important. Um, but remediation is only part of the solution. You know, the focus is always going to be on prevention of the abuses and reform of the policies. You know, that's the most important thing. This should never happen again. So if you remediate all the workers and the same thing happens again, it is completely a failure. But when companies remediate, and we're looking now at the gloves industry, for instance, in Malaysia, $150 million, maybe they're not going to do the same thing again because they don't want to pay another $150 million. You know? So it has a huge impact on motivating the companies to change their behavior. Um, remediation really does have a positive impact, but definitely remediation is not, the, is not the outcome. But we also have to think also that remediation is always, a, you know, when we talk about the UN business human rights framework, they have a three three parts of it. One is uh, protect, one is respect, and one is remedy. The government should protect um, people against adverse human rights. Protect. Number two is respect. The company should respect people to ensure they're not suffering human rights abuses. And number three is a remedy. The government and the company should remedy the violations that have taken place. So when we talk about business human rights, everyone focuses on protect and respect. Everyone talks about developing policies. We have all these UN dialogues of business human rights, UN global principles, whatever. And you know, companies put in place policies, they put in place mechanisms to protect workers. And companies put in place mechanisms to respect workers. But everyone forgets about the remediation. So remediation is always the weakest of the three. But for me, it's what's most important for workers. But definitely, it's just one part um, of a, of a, of a long-term solution. You know? If you don't have any prevention, any mitigation, if you don't have changes to policies, yeah, the, the remediation is good in the short term, but it's not a long-term solution. Okay, so I give a last, yes. Okay, you and Shamil answer the question, and then we go to the last question of the online, and we close the bank, okay? Um, hi, so I have a, a quick question about the strategies that you use to basically make sure that all these things that you do have a good positive impact on workers. I'm very interested in, in workers' rights. Last year I was living in South Africa and I did a course um, at the University of Cape Town about workers' rights and all that. And you have examples like the Marikana massacre where basically people um, complain about their, their the abuses that they were basically receiving and then they got killed. So, I mean, apart from all the money that they, these workers um, receive, how do you what strategies do you use to make sure that the company, I mean, it doesn't reply to you, how can you put pressure on them to do something positive instead of like firing those migrant workers and getting more migrant workers, if that makes sense. If there's any strategy that you use, Actually, one is about using. Um, it's kind of related to something like. Uh, let me hold it. Okay, so one is on like um, the recruitment process itself. What What's your opinion on using uh, technology such as, such as blockchain for transparency? And the other one is: Have you been in a situation where there are regulations against forced labor, be it governmental policies or anything that? You know, it's a set rule. However, um, but the issue is the lack of transparency and also failure to report. And how would you deal or address those kind of issues? Should I read the last one and then you can answer? Uh, so this is from Bandana from Gadget W. Uh, as you rightly say, workers' right protection is not the focus of the U.S. Customs and Border Department, and only in some cases their action may help the workers. So how do you decide 
when to engage with them and when not, because they can be extremely zealous and pushy, regardless of the impact of their work on the workers. So how you select when you engage and not. Then the recruitment uh, fee problem has to be addressed as in the country of origin of the migrant workers. Hopefully effort is put into this. Can you say more about so not only at the end but also the I think with this round if are there any other questions here? No? So with this round we we'll Okay. Um a recruitment fee issue, let's start with that one. Uh, actually, uh, there's kind of a misconception, in, in my opinion. Actually, the recruitment fee issue, um, if we look at the issues in Malaysia and Thailand as an example, actually the root cause of the problem is uh, in Malaysia and Thailand. It's not in the origin country. Uh, so actually, the, the reason why the workers pay so much money for their jobs in Malaysia or in Thailand is because the money is demanded from employers and agents in these countries. You know. So in Thailand and Malaysia, it's the agents and the employers who are demanding so much money from the origin country agents to supply the workers. So people often think that all this money that is collected from Nepalese or Bangladeshi or Indonesian or Myanmar or Cambodian workers in the origin country stays in the origin country, but it's not true. Most of the money that's taken from workers in origin countries ends up often through the Hundi systems in the pockets of people in the destination country. The money is taken in the origin country, but it ends up in the destination country. It's called the kickback process, you know. The kickbacks are paid to the HR departments in Thailand or in Malaysia, or to the agents in Thailand and Malaysia. They're the ones who are making the big money and the corruption of the government in the destination countries that also take a big cut of that money. But actually, the money that's taken from the workers in the origin country, only a small bit of it stays in the origin country. Most of it is sent to the destination country. So I agree completely that it's an issue of both origin country and destination country. Both need to be addressed. But the major factors that create unethical recruitment are caused by the destination country. So if you don't fix those issues in the destination country, there's no point in even looking at the origin country. If the destination country is clean, then you can start to look at the origin country issues, like the abuse of the agents, the corruption, which is often minimal, actually. If you look at Myanmar or Cambodia, uh, Myanmar is probably the better example. The amount of corruption that's taken from workers um, and agents is quite small compared to Malaysia where you have huge amounts of corruption from the government. So, so for me, the main issue of an ethical recruitment is the destination country, not the origin country. But you need to address them both. You know? um, and, the, and, and the typical response, which I get from everywhere, is that if you want to fix ethical recruitment, you have to go to the source. In my opinion, it's completely wrong. It's completely a misunderstanding of how the ethical recruitment process works and how the money flows. It flows from origin to destination. You know, it doesn't flow from destination to origin. So it's that stage. Um, the, the CPB approach, again, I focused on the guns industry. And it was the right time and it's been beneficial, you know, to workers. But as I said, if you use it at the wrong time in the wrong industry, it will be very negative. So for instance, in the middle of a pandemic, when Malaysia is providing 70% of the world's gloves, you can pretty much bet that people are not gonna stop buying the gloves because they have no choice. So when the US imposes sanctions on a company, the company will just sell its gloves somewhere else because there's a huge market. So the chances of there being a risk are very small. But if you to a, the CPB was to impose sanctions on a, and again, I have to be careful here because I also, there's some cases ongoing, but let's talk about the garment industry very broadly, I won't take in detail. If you impose sanctions on the garment industry in one country, the buyers will just move to another country, and then we'll just pull out. So this company gets uh, sanctioned in, we choose a good example, maybe in Bangladesh or, or India or, or Sri Lanka or Cambodia. So they'll stop buying from that company, they just buy from another company. So all the workers lose, you know? So because they lose their jobs. 
So, so you have to be very careful as to how the buyers and how the buyers are going to respond to the sections. You know, if it results in a pullout, then it's very negative. You know, I'm not there, and again, I'm not there to serve the interests of the U.S. employers or the U.S. government. You know, my role is to benefit workers, and I believe that the work I do with CDB benefits workers. And, and you speak to the workers in Malaysia, they're happy. They've got so much money, their conditions have improved. But I don't use it in a negative way. And again, <clears throat> that's an issue I've been coming back to the first question, which is that when you campaign, the response can be so different. You know, if you campaign against uh, a company, let's say uh, in, in, in the border areas of Thailand, and you're successful in your advocacy, it becomes a topic in the media, the, U the government takes action, maybe even the US government takes action, whatever, but the workers lose out. You know, because the people stop buying from the factory. So they just go and buy from another factory and then that factory just closes and opens up with another name in another place. So your whole action has, has been no benefit. So definitely a lot of the time that you're taking action, you really have to look at the benefits. You know? And again, one of the challenges that I find um, recently, as, as my leverage becomes stronger in the work that I'm doing, is that there becomes a responsibility, a more stronger responsibility to make sure that before you open your mouth, before you do something, you have to be sure that it's in the best interest of the workers, otherwise you cannot do anything. And of course sometimes, I'm not the one that controls the world, right? I throw something into the, the mix, but I cannot be sure how my effort will end up, you know? It can end up positive, it can end up negative. I'm not the one that can control it. You can't control your advocacy. You know, you can try your best to ensure that your advocacy has a positive impact, but you're not in control. You know, so you have to think about that very carefully, and you have to make sure that your work has a positive impact, and that's something that is a, a big responsibility. Um, and again, one of the big cases now that I'm involved in is the Atta case in, in Malaysia, which is Dyson. The Dyson's, uh, I think, the biggest uh, supplier of Dyson products in the world. And Dyson, as a result of my campaigning and, and others, has, has said they're pulling out of the factory in June. And there's thousands of jobs that are at risk, you know. And so a lot of criticism has come my way, you know. But the workers have lost out. The workers are going to lose their jobs. The workers are suffering because of your campaign, you know. And then I have to say, well, firstly, we have to, are they really suffering or are they not suffering? In the future, they're going to suffer. If the company pulls out and the, if the company if Dyson pulls out and the company closes down, then the, definitely the workers are going to suffer. You know, maybe they can get another job and it's better conditions. We can say that, but we can't say that. Actually, we're not. It's not our right to say that. You know, oh, it's better for the workers that they lose their job and go another place. But how we can say that? We're not the worker, right? We we cannot impose our opinions. But we have to change the strategy. So if Dyson is going to pull out and Dyson is going to lead to many workers losing their jobs, we have to make sure Dyson is responsible, you know? So we have to shift the campaigning focus to focus on Dyson, you know? And at the end of the day, we have to try everything. And then as again, there are negative impacts of the work that I do. Whistleblowers have been tortured, you know? Whistleblowers have been deported, they've been repatriated, you know? And once that happens, it's my obligation to remediate that situation. Of course, I can never remediate the experience of someone who's been tortured, you know? And I have to do everything to ensure that doesn't happen. But if it does happen, I have to make sure that I fix it, you know? If a worker gets deported, I have to make sure that they have a career in their, in their home country. I have to make sure they have income. So we always have to work to ameliorate the negative impacts. You know? We can't avoid negative impacts completely, but we have to work to ameliorate those. So I think that's the first question, and the uh, the recruitment and the CPB. And the second question was about... Well, we're talking about um, transparency and supply chain. So one of the questions was um, actually, what's your opinion on the usage of supply chain in addressing the lack of transparency um, and, you know, with usage of uh, blockchain? Yeah, yeah. Oh, technology, yeah. yeah. So I have, a, I have a saying, you know, which some people really don't like, you know, um, especially people who often are focused on money. You cannot have technology without trust. You know? First of all, you need trust, then you have technology. Technology on its own cannot 
benefit workers unless there's trust in that technology. So many companies are setting up applications and setting up hotlines and setting up all these kind of things. But the person that's setting it up and the workers have no connection. So, you know, we often see these hotlines are set up, but nobody uses them. All these uh, internet are set up, but nobody uses them. So the thing is, technology is so beneficial, but you really have to look at whether it's going to have a positive impact or not. Blockchain is a, is a good example that can be used to, to track, you know, data that can't be changed, you know. So it, it can have a positive role. But you really have to look at, in my experience, working on migrant worker rights on the ground, most of the technological solutions that have been applied have never benefited the workers. They've benefited the people creating the applications and the companies in terms of PR. We have a hotline, we have an application, we have this, we have that, you know. Because what I say is that me and my team, you know, we only have WhatsApp, Viber, Emo, and Messenger. We have enough work for 10 lifetimes. Yeah? Just from WhatsApp messages, from Facebook messages, from Emo messages, and from Viber messages. We don't need any technological platform. If we have more complaints, we cannot manage them. You know? So you can set up a wonderful hotline, and you can get thousands of complaints, but who's managing the complaints? You know, who's actually fixing the problem? Who's checking that the people are not complaining and not being abused or not being targeted? So that's one of the big issues about technology. Um, and transparency, again, I, I'm going to answer this slightly different question, but one of the most important things for my work, and I'm working very much with the European Parliament on this and also um, with other networks around the world, is that one of the key solutions to all of these problems is transparency of supply chains. We need to be able to link the abuses that are going on in the workplaces with the supply chains. And most of the time, we can never do it. Because there's only one source of data that's available, and that is the US customs records. If I go to Atar factory in Malaysia, and I find abuses, I can go to speak with one of my international partners. A lot of the international NGOs, they support me all the time. I say to them, please check the customs data on this factory. They'll put the factory in, I'll get a whole list of everyone who's buying from that factory. So immediately I can target the companies that are buying, you know. That is the only system in the world where we have access to customs data. But most of the data around the world is, is we cannot access it. In the EU, we, there's no system that we can access to see which goods are going into the EU. It's all confidential, it's all proprietary, it's all um, uh, uh, commercial data. You know, so really what's important for the long term, and again, we can talk about organizing workers, unionization, we can talk about all these kind of frameworks, but actually one of the most important frameworks is transparency. So the more information we get about the goods that are being purchased from a factory, where they come from, where they sell to, that can really be a tool for anybody. You know? Like for instance, if you can go online and you can see where the, if, if you go along and, for instance, you go to uh, Mahachai and you, 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 you're sitting in a noodle shop and you speak to some workers and they say they're being abused in the factory, you can immediately come back to your computer, type in the name of the factory, and all of a sudden Costco, Walmart, Tesco, Morrison's come up. You can immediately write to the company and say, I know that workers are being abused in your factory and they can do something about it. So it's a really powerful tool. Or we can even say, we look at that factory, who is the investor in that factory? So if we know data about investors, if we know data about buyers, then we can really take effective action. You know? But without that data, when we're in the dark, when we don't know where the goods are going, the whole power of activists and unionists and others to, to take action is reduced. So transparency is a, is a really important topic um, and one that's uh, very important as a paradigm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. I think an applause for Andy. I think he has been uh, generous with his time and also with sharing his experience, including the answering to criticism of his work. And indeed, I think uh, when someone does something, for sure is going to be different views about the way it operates. But I think we agree that we cannot remain only with advocacy. Uh, recently reading the newspaper on migrants, we read that they have been discriminated again, that they have to pay more for vaccination and testing 
uh, than other pre-vaccination. Actually, they are still uh, quite excluded, but they have to pay more for testing, uh, for being uh, approved for being in Thailand. So it's conditional on their stay. So there is an own industry that is exploiting them and new exploitation. So this has been going on for decades now. So I think at some point, indeed, advocacy may not be enough. We need to learn other strategies and the plus and minus of those uh, strategies. And in, again, all the controversy and ethical conflict of interest that go with, uh, with that. So thank you again uh, for this very, uh, what me, uh, for me also has been a learning of uh, issue I am not too familiar uh, with uh, when it comes indeed to US customer. <laughs> An issue is not really the most exciting part uh, of the job, but it's indeed important to know about. So thank you again. We have coffee and tea, so please you can continue chatting with Andy here outside and uh, come back for the next event. The exhibition is still outside. This is the last week, and this is about uh, Myanmar, the one year of the coup. Uh, through artwork. I think it's interesting to watch. And the next event on the 15th will be about the new NGO law, which basically is more restrictive uh, for uh, civil society in Thailand. So we are going to discuss that on the 15th. So please continue to come and on your way out give a donation because that supports our activities. Thank you very much to both the one here and the very active uh, one online. Thank you very much.